Welcome back to the Compass Podcast, now the Mining Pod. Today we are joined by Ethan Vera of Luxor Technologies to talk about the Ethereum merge. Yes, it's finally here. We're talking about when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and what alternatives Ethereum miners have. Ethan, welcome back to the Compass Podcast, now the Mining Pod, for those listening. Thanks for joining. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. I've been uh, excited for this, both on the topic and just to come on. I think last time we talked was uh, last September. Yeah, it's been a while. Also, happy Merge Week. Welcome to the Merge. It's finally happening. I I know that you've been skeptical for so long as a miner, but we made it. Merge Week is, is upon us. Any reactions before we dive into some of the topics of conversation? Well, I think, you know, I was in, got caught in the wrong here. I, I thought this merge was not going to happen. Um, it's looking like a very high chance of happening, you know, close to like 99%. Of course, there's, there's always a chance like it gets pulled. We've seen like five difficulty bombs be reset in the past, but it's looking like uh, this time is, is different. So uh, we have about a day and 12 hours left before it happens. Yeah, it's like uh, it's here. And there's definitely some technical things that are outstanding. And, we won't go into these topics for anyone interested. There's a bunch of MEV or minor extractable value related questions are still outstanding around like how are these blocks going to be produced or protect against MEV? Are retail customers protected? Is it too centralized? And these are some of the things that the Ethereum team is going to have to figure out over the next few months to even years, just because a lot of the stuff has not been built. But they're pushing forward regardless. And it definitely is a monumental moment for crypto. Let's go into the merge itself for a little bit and talk about the dynamics of how it is going for the proof of work side. First, we'll try to say the proof of work conversation. So we got this Bordell WTF website, which is showing when the merge is supposed to occur. Uh, Terminal total difficulty is the metric they've been using. Curious if you can explain this for us, uh, what it means and why they didn't use like a block height as opposed to this TDD metric um yeah i'll hand it off to you yeah so this is a good website it's actually the same one our team's using to try and figure out when this merge is going to happen unfortunately we're going to have to have our alarms going off at you know close to 1 a.m probably on thursday night to, to deal with this um and so my understanding with this difficulty bomb is that it's gradual um and so over time uh well it's a very short amount of time the difficulty uh increases so that it becomes uh, impossible for an ASIC to mine. Um, and so like h- how, I guess you can think of like it becoming too difficult for an equipment to mine on a certain difficulty is if you tried to turn on your CPU today and mine on the Bitcoin network, you wouldn't be able to mine a single share to a pool because the difficulty is too high. Um, and so that's kind of like the same, uh, way of thinking of it with this Ethereum difficulty is that they're just going to artificially increase the difficulty until, no piece of hardware on the Ethereum network can, can mine anymore. And then it's, it's more of like a, a gradual transition to proof of stake, but it's going to happen, you know, relatively quickly. Um, rip to all our uh, Ethereum mining friends out there. A few ASICs are out there. They combat it for a bit. The total terminal difficulty is also interesting. The, the swapping mechanism they're using uh, just from the research I've done, basically what it is, is like there's a block height typically is what they use for making these hard forks. You select a block in the future and nodes can download the new information for the hard fork. And then that data will go live once a block height is hit. But they did not want to do that in this case because they're worried about some of the games that miners could play to stop that from occurring. So they picked total terminal difficulty, which is like the aggregate difficulty for the network. Uh, and that difficulty level will be reached at some point, most likely, unless all miners turned off, which would just be unrealistic, right? Because miners are profit incentivized and they're going to pick up as many block rewards as they can. And so we have a ter- total terminal difficulty expected to happen, like you said, at the end of this week or like Wednesday night, late Wednesday night, early Thursday morning, which is pretty exciting. Uh, it's interesting they chose to do it that way. Besides that, like the swap, I don't think is, I don't know if you have any thoughts on it, but it's somewhat boring. So you have like the execution client and you have the con- consensus client. Execution client is all the stuff on top, like, Transactions being moved and dApps 
and all those things move it around assets and then the consensus which is the proof of work and you just have those two lego blocks stuck together and then during the merge you're going to have the execution client pick up and move to a different lego block a different consensus client and it'll be proof of stake and it'll just keep chugging along and as you said the old proof of work ethereum is going to just collapse under the weight of too much difficulty with the ice age happening um, any thoughts on the transition from proof of work to proof of stake on a technical front? Um, no, that's it's, a, it's very complex. So I don't know if I have a ton of thoughts besides just explaining it, but you know, it is. Um, and I, I think you covered it well. Um, I, I did see some on a related note, a lot of the like game theory being uh, thrown back and forth on Twitter of miners shutting off ahead of the, the merge as a way to kind of, um, let's say, disrupt it. Uh, but I agree with your take there. I think miners are completely profit driven. So in the case that miners are shutting down, there are going to be some miners who want every single last reward they can get and will benefit from other miners turning off and, and soak up those rewards. So I, I don't foresee miners really having the ability to coordinate here and, and turn off ahead of them. And in the case they did, there's always people like Joe Lubin, um, Consensus, Web3 Cloud that are you know uh, closer to the Ethereum space that could always pick up the slack and, and mine those final blocks. The difficulty adjustment is, um, you know, it, the algorithm is much different than Bitcoin too. So it adjusts uh, difficulty much quicker in terms of fluctuating network hash rate. So it's not like Bitcoin where you get stuck with the same difficulty for a two-week period on average. So, uh, yeah, I don't foresee much um, pushback from miners uh, as the merge happens here. Going back like a year ago when we were talking about the merge and people have been talking about it for obviously like years now. Did you expect there to be more fireworks going into the final weeks or has this been sort of a wet blanket and nothing much has been happening? To me, it's been sort of a wet blanket. Like I expected miners to put up some sort of fight or maybe try to innovate. But looking at the data, it almost seems like there wasn't much they could do. At the same time, I was still expecting something to happen. It's interesting in mining. Um, really, miners don't have a large presence like they do in Bitcoin. Uh, there's very few public miners, not, not publicly listed, but even miners that are public facing. Um, and the miners that are the, you know, high dates and the high blockchains and the northern days of the world are relatively small percentage of market share as opposed to Bitcoin, uh, where like we go to a conference and there's 50% of the entire network hash rate is represented at that, you know, Bitcoin 2022, for example. Um, and so miners really don't have a unified face. I think largely because it's a bigger retail base. So it's a lot of individuals that have plugged in GPUs and mining. Um, it's a lot of traditional data centers that don't want people to know that they're mining Ethereum and have idle GPU capacity. And then finally, it's a lot of overseas uh, miners in places like China and Russia that uh, aren't as prominent in Western media. So um, to me, it's not surprising that, that Ethereum miners haven't been able to put on a, a good advocacy for, for Ethereum mining here. Um, it's just kind of a nature of the mix of participants. Yeah, and that makes sense. Now looking at network hash rate for Ethereum, we can uh, throw this chart on later. It's about 20%, I'd say, down from all-time highs. Uh, it's difficult to give a good number here because it's just a huge amount of hash rate on the Ethereum network. And, but it's definitely going down because of the merge coming on, which is a segue into our next line of conversation is these big miners who have a lot of GPUs and been stacking for quite a while. And I even saw some orders for GPUs from publicly listed miners this summer. And I was wondering what they were thinking. Maybe they're just in back order and they finally got them delivered. But uh, there's a few miners out there like Hive Blockchain and HUD-8, the first ones that come to mind. I'm sure there's more that mine Ethereum. They have large presences in the Ethereum space and they have a lot of hash rate dedicated to finding Ethereum and swapping into Bitcoin or selling right into the market. So at the very least, they're going to take a trim on the amount of Bitcoin they produce uh, and likely like their total revenues are supposed to shrink as well uh, because there's not necessarily going to be a market for a different product. I'm curious to get your take on the strategy for these miners who are mining Ethereum going to the merge. Uh, did they make the correct play here? And what do you think they do after the merge? Seems like a current call, right? Like There's not a lot you can do, but any insights on what they might do? Buying Ethereum miners... Um, this late into the game, you know, end of 2020, 2021 was a contrarian bet. Not a lot of people were placing it. And so there was a lot of public criticism of the move, like HUD-8 bought all those NVIDIA machines. Um, at the time, though, those machines were incredibly profitable. 
and they had a much better return profile than than Bitcoin ASICs. Um, of course, you can price the risk of a merge uh, however you want if you're like back in 2021 looking onwards. Um, I, I think those purchases in most cases ended up being quite good from a profitability standpoint. They returned their capital within a year. And so they exited their positions, but it was definitely a risky play for them uh, to take on. And that's why you didn't see a lot of companies taking that bet. I always joke like betting on Ethereum um, uh, proof of stake is kind of like a Grayscale's bet on uh, Bitcoin ETF. Uh, Grayscale built an incredible business by just like the ETF never coming. And so many Ethereum miners built such good businesses with proof of stake never coming. That may finally end uh, tomorrow, but it's been a really interesting run for people uh, who have placed that bet and have made outsized returns uh, doing so. So um, in a lot of cases, like it won't turn out to be the best investment ever, but it actually wasn't like too bad for some of the big public codes like Hive, Northern Data, HUD8. That's a really good comparison. And for listeners who aren't familiar with it, GBTC was a product that Grayscale offered for quite a while now. They dominated the market in terms of being able to buy Bitcoin right into your uh, 401k or whatever product you're using for your investments long term. And a lot of people purchased it. They're basically waiting on this conversion to an ETF. That ETF conversion has never come. And over the end of the bull market, we've seen that product basically kill a lot of firms out there, including Three Arrows Capital, uh, because people are expecting that trade to continue to be positive and it went negative and went hard south fast and it killed a lot of people still viable like perhaps there's a conversion at one point and people eat up that arb and it's great but a really nice comparison there because a lot of these miners were betting that proof of stake would never come and they make a lot of money while the rest of the market was thinking that they were stupid Uh, i do think that they've made a lot of money right if we look at some of the numbers for ethereum miners they did pretty well month over month. They had like a 12 month plus streak of actually beating Bitcoin mining revenues. And that was the entire bull market. They're making more than Bitcoin mining revenues. Uh, so you look at Riot, you look at some of these huge facilities, you know, these hundreds of megawatts facilities that Bitcoin mining revenues have propped up. And then you compare it to Ethereum miners that are kind of operating in the shadows. Like you said, they're not very public facing. And one actually has a larger revenue share in the market than the other. It's something that's always confused me, made me scratch my head a little bit. But I do appreciate it that Darren Miners have somewhat been in the shadows as they should be. I want to talk about ETH proof of work. My understanding is that you have a relationship with the teams that have been working on this, or you've had relationships with people who have been kicking this idea around. I want to throw it to you to like understand what Luxor has been doing in terms of ETH proof of work since you guys do run an Ethereum pool. Did you see this as like a viable product? Was this something that just didn't quite happen uh, the way you wanted it to? Uh, I know there's a lot of ETH proof of work ideas out there. So the one that sort of coalesced at this point, I understand is not doing great, but I don't know much about it. So I'll hand it over to you. Uh, our, our view on the space was that Ethereum is an incredibly valuable blockchain and it's been proven by all the applications built on top. Stable coins like USDC, USDT, um, you have things like Link, Uniswap built on it. Obviously, the, the Metaverse and NFT wave has been huge for it. Uh, you know, Board Ape, th- those sorts of uh, applications. And that really ties back to that revenue point you made is a large part of the increase in Ethereum mining revenue higher than Bitcoin has been because of all the applications and use cases that are built on Ethereum. So our our hope from an advocacy standpoint was that Ethereum, as it stood, wouldn't move to to proof of stake and it would stay in its proof of work form. Um, And so we we tried to put together an advocacy group here to advocate for that and advocate some of the the benefits of staying proof of work and some of the potential risks of, of a bad migration. Unfortunately, we just didn't get great reception from it. We created like a community letter. We took it to a bunch of non-miners to see if they'd support it. And uh, we, we did not get the warmest of welcomes, let's say. Um, so th- that unfortunately failed. Uh, but uh, there, there are obviously like a, a myriad of other products that miners will go to, some of which will be Ethereum proof of work forks. I think Luxor's position as of now is we're, we're not going to play in a large way in uh, the future of kind of GPU mining and uh, potential Ethereum forks. And we think that unless the merge fails, like a lot of those forks will have a hard time gaining traction. Yeah, they don't look to be going that well so far. I saw a thread from an ETC developer 
or someone who claimed to be an ETC developer from back in the day who was criticizing the ETH proof of work project that I think most people are forming around at this point. And just talking about how their GitHub is just like a mess. Like there's nothing is pulled correctly. There nothing's added correctly. It's just a mess. Uh, they're not even like closing comments correctly. And I think we even saw like Coinbase tweeting publicly about how the chain ID wasn't even set correctly for ETH proof of work. Uh, basically, you open your chain up to a bunch of problems, including relay attacks. Essentially, make your chain impossible to use if, unless you get some of that stuff figured out. And this is actually something that a lot of Ethereum developers over the years actually predicted would happen that anyone who had worked on the client side of Ethereum would not help an ETH proof of work fork unless they were motivated by outsized gains. And it seems to be happening because there's, I don't see any developers really willing to help this ETH proof of work chain out. Like, I think most people, they want a GPU mineable smart contract chain. They're going to a different project or they're working on ETC and they don't seem to be working on Ethereum. Is that what you've sort of seen as well? For sure. I, I think the majority of people are waiting to see how this merge plays out. If the merge goes smoothly, then there's no need for these developers to look to build on other chains. Um, in the case that for some reason this merge goes poorly, then that's when ETH proof of work, ETC, Ravencoin, the rest of the smart contract platforms really have their task cut out for them to attract those developers to their uh, individual networks. Um, and so th there's chains like Ethereum Classic that have had large donations and pool donated 10 million, uh, I guess a month and a half back now. Um, so that I'll definitely incentivize and pay some salaries of developers to come over. But I think long term, you need to incentivize people through phil philosophical reasons. People want to build on your chain uh, because they support the network. If you look at Ethereum today, it's probably the largest open source amount of engineers working on something unpaid because people are aligned with it and, and really think it's cool to work with. And so uh, those other chains really need to pursue the same thing if they want that level of uh, development onto their own uh, networks. I love the Raven coin plug. We always have to get that when you're on the podcast. Uh, I want to talk about <laughs> alternatives, either coins, AI, seen some random GPU stuff out there. Where are these GPU miners looking so far from your perspective and being a mining pool and talking with some of these GPU operators? We did a lot of analysis on what we call like a hash price floor or resistance level. Basically at the concept that uh, if you can guess the average efficiency of the hardware out there uh, based on like the mix of hardware and then also the operating cost, you can determine how much their cost of production is per unit of compute. And so you can determine like how low can the revenue go for that unit of compute before their gross profit is equal to zero. And in that case, no one else wants to contribute hash right there. So using that methodology uh, with the various alternative coins, we came up with around like 10 to 15% of the Ethereum network can go find homes in other coins. So about like, let's call it like 100 terahash can go distribute across ETC, Ravencoin, uh, Ergo, and, and some of the others. So only really the top tier efficient miners that have the best hardware, the lowest operating cost will be able to move over. Everyone else will have nowhere to go in terms of cryptocurrency mining. Yeah, one thing I want to get your take on is all these other coins popping up. I mean, they've been in development for a while. Uh, there's been like, you know, Ravencoin has been around for quite a while. And there's a few other GPU mineable smart contract chains that have basically made their whole uh, bed on the Ethereum merge and they're sort of popping up. And miners have been shilling them, trying to get people to move to them. And to me, it's, it's funny looking at the value proposition that they're pointing across being that miners will support that network because it just comes off wrong, right? And I want to get your take on it like from a marketing perspective. I don't feel like there's been really solid marketing from some of these chains. Instead, they should have been talking about like for developers, like this applications are easy to build on. We're using this smart contract language. We're doing this to incentivize developers to move over. But there's been a lot of talk about like supporting miners. And I don't think that resonates with a lot of people unless you're in the mining community. Like I think, especially in the smart contract world of blockchains, most people see miners as rent seekers and not necessarily builders. I think that's different in Bitcoin. I think people in Bitcoin see miners as some sort of like protection of the network and security. But definitely in smart contract chains, it's a different world. Like people don't, for the most part, like miners. I, I fully agree with that. Um, I, th I think when you look across like the three major chains, uh, Ethereum Classic, Raven, and Ergo, none of them are positioning that way. Um, 
and there's a, a number of other kind of smart contract platforms that are vying for miners to come over, but those are the main three. ETC is at a seven billion dollar market cap. Ravencoin just over one, or it goes like at 0.5. So uh, it kind of drops off a cliff there after Ergo. So um, it, it may be the case that some of those networks gain in terms of popularity because miners are coming over, but they're growing on a small base. So it's not really going to push the needle in terms of like where it can existing Ethereum hash rate go to. And uh, I agree with you, like. For them to really take off, they need to focus on developers, applications, building out their fee system. Um, you, ne- you need those extra fees in the form of TX fees, tips, MEV to attract miners long term. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to see. I mean, Ethereum Classic at a $7 billion market cap is still impressive given the fact they've been 51% attacked so many times. <laughs> um, they've obviously picked the right allies and people like Barry Silbert and, and others to like pump it and, and hold up some of its value, but um, 7 billion. I mean, I've never built a $7 billion market cap before, so nothing to scoff at. Hey, Luxor is going to get there one day. Don't you worry. Uh, I, I I like the point about Barry Silbert because there is like some ghosts of Ethereum pass within this that's going to be brought up this week. And if things go poorly over the next few weeks, like why didn't Ethereum stay proof of work? Is there questions around uh, moving to Ethereum Classic? Is it actually... Um, has it kept with the original chain since Genesis? Because there have actually been some Ethereum classic changes that some people think that it's not a canonical chain, that there has been things that have interrupted it. And as we know, like Ethereum classic is all about like uh, code is law. And that's opposed to Ethereum, which has moved into more like we want it to be like technically the best and keep moving forward. So I think there's going to be some narrative threads to pull on over the next few weeks if things go poorly. One question I want to boot over to you again is like, for GPU operators who are looking into different things. Uh, AI stuff has been a conversation. Also, rendering has been a big conversation. There's even like entire coins and networks and protocols being booted up around rendering. None of this stuff seems developed enough. It just really seems out there. And I've seen a few press releases. I saw Hive Blockchain talking about this. And they're planning on looking into a few things. I think Hade as, as well. What's the plan here? I mean, I think most people have paid off the capital on these GPUs, but they're just going to have a huge supply of GPUs in a glut of a market that doesn't need all this GPU power. And at the same time, if you look at the prices of GPUs, they're crashing. The stock, uh, NVIDIA stock price has gone down 40% uh, over the past year. And I look at GPUs like you know, there's no floor for these things right now. Nobody wants to buy them. Um, what do you think? these miners are going to do with all these GPUs on their hands if there's nothing to do with them? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So uh, I do think like maybe 10, 10, 15% of it will move to the other currencies. Those will be like the best machines, like 3090s. In in that case, like those people will still be able to mine, but their hash price, you know, Ethereum generated per mega hash per day is going to be like dropped in half basically. And their gross profit will, will head towards zero on those machines. Um, and so it's it's still not going to be great economics. At the same time, the price of those machines, if the value that they're getting in terms of revenue drops by half, you can imagine that the value of the machine itself will also drop by a significant amount, you know, maybe half or more. So their their mining fleet is going to be worth a lot, a lot less. In terms of use cases outside of uh, blockchain, um, there's a number of concerns here. One is that a lot of the hardware on the Ethereum network is very old, and so you can't perform like a lot of modern day uh, high performance compute. Uh, with like very old like 1080s, for example. Um, so um, people who say they can use like old generation hardware for that is kind of like just coping. Um, the other consideration too is Ethereum mining and, and any b- mining, like so Bitcoin mining, is, for example, is one of the best buyers of compute power out there because it's a 24-7 buyer, no questions asked. At any point in time, if you have an excess hardware, you know, an ASIC, you can plug it into the Bitcoin network and get paid for it. If you have a GPU, you can plug it into the Ethereum network and get paid for it. With those um, kind of more like video rendering, AI, high performance compute, you now need to get a customer. You're now a customer facing business where you have to go to a university and convince their AI department to use your hardware between 4 to 7 p.m. when they're running their AI training modules. So it becomes a very different business model that not a lot of companies are equipped to deal with. Um, you know, an individual retail miner with 
you know, a hundred mining rigs is not going to go convince some university that critically needs that compute power that they can supply that. Um, they go to the Googles and the Amazons of the world, um, especially because they have a lot of tooling built on AWS, Azure, and uh, you know, GCP. So it, it's not an easy business to get into. Um, and uh, I, I think companies like the HUD 8s and the Hives are in a better position to kind of transition a, a bit towards that, especially HUD 8, who has a traditional data center, so they know how to do, run it. But uh, certainly the majority of miners are not going to suddenly turn from mining Ethereum to doing you know, video rendering and AI testing. Yeah, I have to agree with you. The customer focus there is interesting, right? You basically have to change your entire business model to do customer relations, which is not super easy. One thing I'm sort of looking for, and maybe I'll even throw a prediction out here, is NVIDIA's stock price to plummet after the merge happens. Uh, it might already be priced in. But I'm somewhat suspecting that we're going to see more pummeling for NVIDIA, AMD, anything with GPU exposure. Uh, that's sort of just a prediction I'll throw out there. I want Hashtag, to turn uh, to not investment <laughs> advice. <laughs> not investment advice. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, I think but the, the GPU market is around like 25 billion in a year in hardware. And so if you look at the Ethereum network based on like an estimated um, hardware mix, you'd probably estimate that the number of GPUs that will be obsolete after this merge is like five to seven and a half billion worth. And so you're adding like a considerable amount of GPUs into the circulating supply, which signif- like will have significant impact on price for sure. And you're taking away a big demand function too. So you're significantly jacking supply while stripping demand side. It's going to be very tough for GPU prices over the next uh, couple of years. Shout out to NVIDIA and AMD. Hopefully they can figure it out. Last line of conversation I want to ask you about is validators. So we've seen a lot of uh, pools boot up validation or validators or validation pool, however you want to say it, over the last year or so. You mentioned Stakefish before we jumped on the podcast. There's a few others. Ethermine has booted up its own as well. And this made sense, right? You could either stick with GPU mining until the end and bet that it wasn't going to happen. Or you could GPU mine and start transitioning into a validator pool using some of the mining rewards that you had uh, to validate the Ethereum network and validate Beacon Chain. And that made sense if you were really bullish on proof of stake and actually sort of taking a, if you're risk adverse and thinking that proof of stake would occur. Uh, And I think those people are in a very good position to earn a lot of rewards, especially if you look at some of the future forecasting and modeling on not only block rewards from proof of stake, but also MEV rewards. If you're a validator in the system, you have an outsized ability to garner more rewards from the system. And it made sense, right? You're mining, just move it over to validation and continue your business going forward. Most businesses have to change a lot of their core functionalities over the years. So why not just do that? That being said, a lot of miners chose not to do that, right? They sold all their their coins right into the open market. And I think that was mostly because of the bull market. We saw big or we saw Ethereum break past $4,000 per coin two separate times. It's actually held up pretty well. I think we're around like $1,500 per Ethereum token. So I think it made sense for miners just to sell off or swap it into Bitcoin, especially with ETH BTC being so high. But now it's like, uh, okay, you made that decision and you don't really have a business anymore. You don't have cash flows. I want to get your take on it. Was it foolish for a lot of these miners not to boot up a validation network or become validators on proof of stake? I, I can see why they don't. Uh, miners that make money in my, like in mining, whether Ethereum or Bitcoin, have a competitive advantage in sourcing power, tuning GPUs, running good operations. None of this is easy. Um, it's a lot harder to build a mining farm than people suspect, and only a few people in the world can can do it well. Um, so the people who made outsized returns in mining were were those people, which are is not the same skill set as running uh, staking infrastructure. So, I mean, the infrastructure and technical uh, side of staking is actually like, you know, not too difficult. It's accumulating funds. That's the hard part. And so the business model for running a staking business in a lot of cases is like, how do you raise money from like LPs? Or if you have your own funds, you can stake that. But like, it's really a game of accumulating assets under management, um, which is an entirely different business model than building out farms, getting access to power and plugging in machines. Um, and that's why I think some of the pools are in a better position to become prominent players in the staking business because they have historically had a business where they do go ask people for a hash rate. Instead of now asking them for a hash rate, they're asking them for funds. 
So they already have kind of like a business development team. They have marketing, branding, that sort of thing. Um, so somebody like uh, Ethermine or Steakfish is now going uh, to, you know, s- some overlapping uh, segments, but also new uh, potential LPs and, and asking them for funds uh, to invest in them. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I, I kind of see why miners are not really participating participating in a big way in the, in the staking world. I don't know. I, I kind of flip on the other side of the conversation. I feel like you got to be dynamic, especially in crypto. So I, I feel like if you were at a mining company that had Ethereum exposure, even if Bitcoin was your key product, I would have been advocating to boot up some sort of validation scheme, um, even if you're just using someone else. But especially if you have the ability to have a developer team and get something going, get some MVV stuff going as well. Seems like a very simple transition. But on the flip side yeah. of your argument, it's it's kind of like that inertia from being in a corporation. You sometimes just want to focus on your key product and not focus on anything else, especially something like proof of stake, which the target has moved around on so much. The staking business really intellectually is not very exciting. You will never see like a convention like we see in mining of staking enthusiasts that come together um, to start presenting on their staking business because every business is the exact same. If I have 10 Ethereum and you have 10 Ethereum, we're going to earn the same yield. Whereas if I have $10 to put into mining and you have $10, there's a chance that we have much different return profiles. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's there's going to be a lack of enthusiasm to like really participate in staking. It's just going to be a, a game of like accumulating capital. And outside of like the mining pools, like, or sorry, the staking pools like Lido and Coinbase, like you won't hear about businesses that make up like those much, right? Whereas in mining, you're we're learning about Riot, we're hearing about their response to man in Texas. Like there's a there's articles being written about them that, that's just not gonna happen in staking. Yeah, it's a little bit more boring. And people think Bitcoin mining is boring, but this is a this is a pretty seamless. It's just like deposit your money and then watch it grow a little bit, just slightly. Now it makes sense. Wanna get some last minute predictions from you before we dip out anything going into this week, the merge that people should be aware of, or you think that could possibly happen or you think smooth sailing you have like a a threshold where you're saying like 60 percent chance we're going to be pretty good 40 percent chance something bad happens or where you at with it the amount of smart people uh that i highly respect that deal in absolutes on the merges is fascinating to me uh <laughs> after watching was it star wars episode three i was like i'm never going to deal in absolutes again um, so I think the chance of the merge not happening is non-zero. I think there's at least a couple percent chance that it, it doesn't happen. And then the chances of a bad merge is, is definitely a few percent as well. Mm. Um, so take that as you will. Like, um, I, I think f- from like Luxor's perspective, we're trying to limit our exposure to Ethereum and Ethereum-based products like stable coins in case of a bad merge. But I think every direction is pointing towards the merge happening and the merge going somewhat well, at least in the beginning. No, I like that. It's a a good perspective on it. And I totally agree with you. Um, We'll see what happens. I I do think it goes pretty smoothly myself, but you never know. Last question, Bitcoin mining. We'll have to get back to Bitcoin mining for just the last question. I think the last time we had you on, we predicted some hash rate for Bitcoin network. I want to see where you're at. What's your prediction now? I think we're at around 2.30. I haven't looked today. What do you see us being at by the end of this year? I was probably so wrong on our last one, um, as was most people. You're probably I like think. in a 350 camp, I bet. Uh, I think I peaked at like 315. <laughs> I think 315, 320, but okay. definitely higher than <laughs> that we're at. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, it's been an interesting run. I think there's a lot of hash rate growth, largely due to the XPs getting plugged in, uh, higher efficiency machines. Um, I think a lot of the old generation machines that got unplugged in kind of beginning of Q2 have now made their way to Venezuela and Kazakhstan and they're getting plugged in close to zero uh, since power. Um, so I think those have been some nice tailwinds. And then finally, uh, some infrastructure has been cleared up. Guys like Marathon are plugging in more machines too. Um, so it seems like that will continue here. Um, I do think there's this concept of a hash price floor. Uh, that's probably based on current operating costs of let's call it like an industry average of like five cents. You know, uh, an S19 is like an average efficiency of equipment that's at around like six, six and a half cents a terahash. And so we probably have room to increase like network hash rate by another 25, 30%. Um, 
at that point, I think we actually won't be moving up really a network hash rate too much. Um, besides like some efficiency gains, the hash rate goes a little slow because every, you know, XP 140 terahash you plug in, like at least like a hundred terahash of old gen machines are going to get unplugged for that equivalent and high cost operators will go offline. So I, I think we could march up to like 260, 270 exahash by uh, end of year if things uh, stay the same and XPs continue to get delivered. Okay. 260, 270. You heard it here first, Ethan Vera. Thanks for joining the <laughs> mining pod. Enjoy your time. Uh, enjoyed your, the time today. And I think you're right with 260. I think I'm still like 249. Price is right rules. But 260 is pretty good. Love to reconvene after uh, end of year then. Let's do it. Let's do it. Ethan, good to see Thanks you again. For Thanks on. for joining the pod.